Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar today, uh, sponsored by the Hymn Society of the United States and Canada. My name is Mike McMahon, and I'm the Executive Director. Today, we're really, really delighted to be welcoming Maria Cornu to uh, lead this webinar on uh, song in Latin America. Uh, Maria is the Associate Director and Program Manager for International and Intercultural Learning for the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship. She was born and raised in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and holds a PhD from the University of Amsterdam. Uh, she was the co-managing editor of the bilingual, that is English-Spanish hymnal, Santo, 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 Holy, 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 that was published by GAI publication, GIA Publications in 2019 in cooperation with the Calvin Institute. Um, I've had the pleasure of, of witnessing Maria as a, as a leader of learning uh, at the Calvin Symposium. Uh, and she's a great um, facilitator and asks great questions. And I'm sure she's going to help us uh, dig in today to learn a lot more about Latin American song. So if you would like to interact with Maria during the session today, you can uh, use the chat function on your uh, Zoom screen. Um, and if you have questions, please put those in the Q&A, which are also available through your uh, Zoom screen. Uh, the, today's presentation is pre-recorded, but Maria is here live and she can interact with you during the um, presentation to answer questions or to um, reflect on points that you might be raising during the time together. So please enjoy today's session. And here now is Maria Cornu. I'm very grateful to the Hymn Society for this invitation uh, to share this webinar with you on Latin American song. I'm grateful also that they chose this topic as part of the series on the world sings. And I'm grateful for each one of you joining us uh, for this conversation. As some of you may know, I am originally from Argentina. I'm a Protestant. And my academic field is a um, history of Protestant worship in Argentina. This will be my lenses for this presentation. Uh, I will focus on uh, Latin American song in a Spanish language, which means including or making references to Spain too. And uh, my um, main uh, focus will be on, uh, on the Protestant side, even though I will make references to the Catholic world too. Um, in addition to this, um, I work at the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship, and I have been uh, involved for over five years in a wonderful project um, as one of the co-managing editors for the hymnal, Holy, 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 Songs for the People of God, Santo, 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 Cantos para el Pueblo de Dios, uh, published by uh, GIA Publications, so I will make many references to the hymnal throughout the presentation. When did congregational singing in Spanish language start? Much earlier than most people think. Even though we don't have any Protestant hymns composed in Spanish language during the 16th century, there was a reformation in Spain in that century and there is evidence of some sort of psalm singing during that time. It is likely that under the influence of John Calvin and the Genevan Psalter, there were some attempts to have metrified psalms in Spanish. In 1557, it was published an edition of the psalms translated into Castilian by Juan Pérez de Pineda. Without music, this edition seems to have been aimed at Spanish refugees in Geneva. Yet, there was another edition of the Psalms, published also in Geneva in 1606, um, attributed to Juan Lequest, which seems to, have to be a pseudonym for uh, one of the reformers, Juan Encinas, uh, those were dangerous uh, times for Spaniards who had sympathies for the Reformation. This um, Psalter is limited to 60 Psalms, but interestingly, these Psalms are metrified, 
These psalms were translated from the Hebrew Bible and not from the Latin, and they worked with the melodies from the Genevan Psalter. I find worth of noting that the Genevan Psalter in Dutch, for example, is from 1556, so these publications in Spanish are among the oldest in Europe. However, because Protestantism was eradicated from Spain uh, by the Spanish Inquisition, it can't be affirmed that metrified psalms were used in Spain in the 16th century, albeit the possibility should not be entirely ruled out. Nevertheless, it can be affirmed that some sort of psalm singing um, was practiced at least among uh, Spanish Protestants in the exile. In, in one of his works, uh, Cipriano de Valera makes uh, several references to sound singing in public worship, particularly during communion. Undoubtedly, a very significant contribution of the 16th century Spanish reformers to worship, to liturgy, to Latin American song, was the Bible translation into Castilian. Uh, the Reina Valera Bible, the first Protestant uh, Bible in Spanish, or in Castilian Spanish. Um, the first uh, edition of this Bible was the work mostly of a monk called Casiodoro de Reina, and this is known as Biblia del Oso, because there is a bear printed on the cover. Uh, this translation was uh, made from uh, the Hebrew and the Greek, and it was very soon after revised by Cipriano de Valera, another monk from the same monastery in Seville. These monks um, went into exile. Valera was uh, a Calvinist, did this um, uh, revision, and from there, from 1602, this Bible is usually known by the last names of these two monks, uh, Reina and Valera. The Reina Valera translation was revised several times, and one of the, its revisions, the 1960, is still the most uh, used Bible uh, among Protestants, particularly among uh, Evangelicals. And so, uh, in most cases, Latin American Protestant song that quotes the scriptures, quotes the scriptures from this uh, Bible translation. After Protestantism was eradicated from Spain in the 16th century, very soon after it started, uh, and consequently Protestantism was banned in all uh, the territories in the Americas controlled by the Spanish crown. Um, there is no um, printed uh, evidence of any form of congregational singing in a Spanish language until the 19th century. On the screen, you have a list of the oldest uh, hymn books published in a Spanish language. The oldest is from 1835. This was the first hymn collection ever published in a Spanish language. Uh, it was edited by a British Wesleyan missionary called William Harris Rule. Um, it was published in Cadiz, Spain, and it was a text-only version. Uh, that was possible because um, that year there was a liberal revolution against the monarchy in Spain, uh, and then it was the monarchy the one um, which granted uh, Roman Catholicism as the only allowed religion in Spain. So there was this um, small window, and the Protestant took advantage of this political window to publish this uh, first hymnal. This hymnal was reprinted in New York in 1848 by the American Tract Society in New York. It is curious that uh, even though um, sun singing was somehow declining in other parts of the world, this uh, hymnal includes metrified psalms, and it's even more curious that some of these psalms are uh, paraphrased or translations from the Latin by Roman Catholic poets. As you can see on this page, that is um, a copy, it's a page from that hymn book, uh, even um, it was kept the title in Latin. 
Uh, and this is um, particularly remarkable if we consider the tensions between Protestants and Roman Catholics in Spain. As you may note on the screen, um, there were decades after the first hymn book where there are no publications, and this is linked to the political situation in Spain, uh, where the monarchy uh, resumed power and um, did not allow minority um, religions um, to um, hold their services or to have freedom of religion or not even uh, religious tolerance. And then in 1868, another opportunity with changing government. Uh, and then we see this um, uh, hymn books published. In uh, 1868, the second uh, hymn book published in Spanish language, uh, it's an interesting collection uh, by Mateo Cosido Anglés. This one has music and all the lyrics and tunes were original. They were not translations. Most of the tunes uh, of the lyrics were by Mateo Cosido himself. And I included a, a question mark on the screen because uh, some scholars believe that the tunes were in fact not so original, but adaptations from tunes used in France where Cosido became a Protestant Christian. Um, then from 1869, we find um, this name, Juan Bautista Cabrera Ibarz. Uh, he edited this uh, hymn book, um, Himnos para el Uso de la Iglesia Evangelica Española, in Madrid, Spain. But Cabrera became a very prolific um, hymn writer, hymn translator, um, and hymn uh, editor. So it's worth of noting um, his presence here and his work in this hymn book in the 1871 that it's also on the screen because many of the uh, following hymn books published in Spain and in Latin America uh, will draw upon uh, the work of Cabrera y Barz. Here on the screen you see uh, the four hymn books edited by Cabrera y Barz. These were um, hymn books with over 200 entries. Um, many of these entries were Cabrera's translations or Cabrera's composition. Cabrera um, is a fascinating character. He was a Spanish. He was a Roman Catholic priest uh, converted to Protestantism. And uh, as a Protestant, he became a founder and first bishop of the Spanish Episcopal Reformed Church. Cabrera was um, a prolific hymn um, translator. Uh, he translated, for instance, uh, Holy, 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 uh, Santo, Santo, Santo. He translated a Mighty Fortress, not from German, but from English. Um, he was a hymn composer, and also he um, wrote a very unique book of liturgy. This book, was a hybrid of the Book of Common Prayer and the Mozarabic Rite. The Mozarabic Rite was an old Visigothic rite preserved by Catholic Spaniards living under Muslim rulers in the Iberic Peninsula. In contrast to most Protestants of his time in Spain, Cabrera's liturgical vision was a continuity with the old Spanish Christian ritual and Christian early hymnody and poetry previous to the 11th century when the Roman rite was imposed in Spain. In his hymn books, Cabrera included translations from all Latin hymns. For instance, uh, the hymn, O Come, All Ye Faithful, hmm? Adestes Fideles, uh, in, in Santo, 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 Holy, Holy, Holy is number 97, but also um, a hymn translated from Latin, O es caviatorium, um, translated by Cabrera as O Pan del Cielo, um, titled O Bread of Heaven, uh, translated uh, into English by Mel Bringle for um, Oremos Cantando, We Pray in Song, and included also in Holy, 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 Santo, 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 uh, number 687. 
Um, another interesting feature of Cabrera's hymnals was the organization, because he followed May seasons of the Christian year, and some songs that were suitable for the daily office, morning and evening songs. As, um, as noted on the screen, Cabrera edited four hymnals, composed 97 hymns, and translated 47 hymns, becoming one of the most influential characters in Spanish language hymnody in the 19th century. Coming back to this um, list of hymns, I'd like to emphasize that after 1871, uh, where uh, the second uh, hymn book edited by Cabrera was published, um, some hymn books started to be published in Latin America. So, and this is where the influences go back and forth from one continent to the other. For instance, you have on the screen at the bottom the 1893 hymnal published um, by the American Tract Society in New York. Uh, this hymn book was revised in 1914 and published as El Nuevo Himnario Evangelico. This hymn book contained 348 hymns. Only about 4%, 13 to 15, were original Spanish compos language compositions. In the revised edition, the 1914 edition, included 19 hymns by Mexican composers, six of which were by Epigenio Velasco. So you start at the end of the 19th century um, noticing more and more the mutual influence between Spain and Latin America, between uh, translators in Spain, translators in Latin America, and the very uh, tepidly uh, emergence of um, composers in Latin America, uh, in addition to some original compositions from Spain. This is a list of some of the oldest uh, hymn books published in Spanish language in Latin America. Um, it's not comprehensive, it's just a sampler. Um, the oldest uh, in this list is from 1871, um, uh, a small collection of hymns published in Chile um, by two Presbyterian missionaries, Alexander Moss Merwin and David Trumbull. Um, this collection um, included um, 50 hymns without music, and a revised edition was published in 1874 with 59 hymns. Um, then we have, uh, in 1875, the uh, first hymn book ever published in Mexico, in this case um, by uh, Thomas Westrup, a British um, missionary who ended up working for the Southern Baptists in Mexico, and a very prolific hymn translator. Um, the second edition of this hymn book uh, was comprised of 97 hymns, 72 of which were Westrup's translation. In his life, uh, Westrup um, translated many hymns, and for instance, uh, the hymn book published in New York um, aimed to serve uh, most uh, denominations throughout Latin America in 1895, included 125 uh, Westrup's translations. Um, uh, 1876, we have another hymnal, hymnal published in Mexico, the, in this case by the Methodists. Um, Butler and Rule were the editors. The edition with music was published in 1881. 1877, another hymn book in Mexico, in this case uh, published by Presbyterian um, Hutch, Hutchinson. And in 1881, the first uh, hymn book ever published in Argentina, in this case uh, by a Methodist missionary uh, called Henry uh, Jackson. Um, what we can learn about these hymn books and uh, would be influential um, throughout Latin America uh, in the 19th century, in the end, particularly of the 19th century and most part of the 20th century, is that, as you can um, note, 
In most cases, these hymn books did not uh, include um, any reference to a particular denomination in the titles. In most cases, they were uh, titled, or the title included the word evangelico, evangelical. That was the word used by Protestants in Latin America who didn't want to name themselves as Protestants because they, they believed Protestant was somehow a pejorative term and chose evangelico, which in Spanish, evangelico is close to evangelio, which is gospel. So um, that was the, the, the common term, uh, the common term most Protestants use to identify themselves. And it's interesting that when they published these hymn books, in most cases, they published the hymn books with the idea to serve their own denominations, but also other uh, Protestant groups in the region and in uh, the subcontinent. Um, another um, interesting feature is that most of the old and oldest hymn books were published without music. This was due uh, to technical and financial constraints, but also to the perception by the missionaries that most people in the pews in Spanish-speaking congregations uh, did not know how to read music. New hymn books uh, were drawing upon those published before on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. This created a lot of interaction back and forth, and this exchange contributed to the development of a common pool of Protestant hymns. And I would argue this favor certain uh, homogenization of Latin American or Latino Protestant hymnic repertoire. A turning point in this history of hymn books and Latin American hymnody was the 1870s and the emergence of uh, gospel hymnody in the US. Uh, hymn books published after 1880s started including an increasing number of hymns from this stream which took precedence over other repertoire used before. Some older and beloved hymns continued being used in Protestant circles, such as hymns by Charles Wesley and Isaac Watts, but gospel hymns became noticeably the dominant genre. For a near a century among mainline denominations and beyond the century for evangelical groups. The preference given to uh, gospel hymns countered some of the first efforts made by Spanish hymnologists, particularly um, these translations I mentioned before that were made from the Latin. Uh, this, uh, these songs were disregard, disregarded by missionaries because for them were probably too Roman Catholic and um, this repertoire was uh, replaced uh, by um, gospel hymns. Um, in the same line, the prevalence of uh, gospel hymnody meant the exclusion of other hymnic translations, even Protestant hymnic translations, um, from the Spanish-speaking hymnals in this period of time. A good example of this are the German chorales. Some of them were translated very early um, due to the work of a German missionary to Spain, Federico Flidner, Fritz Flidner. This missionary died in 1901, so his translations were uh, from the end of the uh, 19th century. But they were not introduced in uh, Spanish language hymn books until the 60s. Uh, where they were in, introduced to the Latin American broader audience by uh, Pablo Sosa when he edited uh, the hymn book uh, Cantico Nuevo, published in Argentina in 1962. Other uh, clear consequence of the pervasive use of the gospel hymns was the general tendency among uh, Latin American Protestants to identify this genre almost an, an exclusive sacred music style in detriment of native tunes. Pablo Sosa makes an interesting claim about uh, how global and how influential gospel uh, hymn tradition was. And he says, quote, the propagation of gospel hymns and songs from the US to the rest of the world 
via the modern Protestant missionary movement is an extraordinary intercultural event that has not been properly evaluated, perhaps due to the disregard, even contempt, of classical church musicians and scholars for popular music. At a time when sound recording systems and radio had not been invented and music printing was a still precarious activity in many parts of the world, these songs, translated and taught by missionaries all over the world, were adopted by local converts as their own and eventually esteemed in places such as Latin America as the true Protestant or evangelical style of music and hymnology." End of quote. In practice, this means that we cannot underestimate the formation power of these hymns when a repertoire was in place for over a century and, uh, and has been so dominant so pervasive. So when we look at uh, evangelical, evangelical churches in Latin America today and uh, Spanish-speaking congregations in the U.S., uh, their beliefs, um, we have to consider the influence of this tradition and also how this uh, tradition countered um, or delayed the emergence of um, native tunes and native music in Latin America, as well as in other parts of the world. The prevalence of the gospel hymnody uh, meant also that, at least during the first half of the 20th century, there were not so many Latin American composers. Yet, there were some of them uh, that are not, um, worth of noting. And uh, on the screen, you have two names, uh, Vicente Mendoza Polanco from Mexico and Alfredo Colum Maldonado from Guatemala. Um, even though they composed their songs in, in the same um, theological tradition uh, of the gospel hymns, uh, they introduced some uh, of the local flavor in the, in the tunes and started writing from their own experiences. Vicente Mendoza uh, was a Mexican, a Methodist, evangelist, hymn writer, uh, hymn translator, and he composed one of the most beloved hymns from this era in Spanish language, Jesus es mi rey soberano, Jesus is my sovereign king. Um, and it's curious that this song was composed uh, throughout a journey of six years um, when uh, Mendoza lived in between the two countries, in between Mexico and uh, the U.S. And um, so it, it has this flavor also of uh, a migrant hymn. Let's listen to a recording of this song. The Christology of this hymn by uh, Mendoza deals with the paradoxical image of Jesus as king, as his friend, as authority, but also with familial closeness. The song also conveys a message of contentment, 
Having Jesus is enough to be happy in life. This topic will uh, remain uh, very important uh, throughout uh, the century in Latin American hymnody. The same with the idea of Jesus as friend, particularly in a context where um, many people who joined Protestantism was excluded from other uh, circles and even from their own families of origin. Um, the other interesting character uh, in, uh, on this screen uh, in, that represents um, Latin American hymnody in these first uh, decades of the 20th century uh, was Alfredo Colón Maldonado, 1903-1971. Um, Maldonado was a Guatemalan evangelist and composer, um, and a feature that stands out to me is the number of songs uh, he wrote about Jesus' ministry on earth and how he appeals in his poetry to Jesus' body. Um, I find this interesting because in, in the context of Protestantism, where there were no images of uh, the body of Jesus or the crucified body, uh, in poetry, Maldonado um, brings back the imagery of the body of Jesus, but th in this case, the body of the Jesus who lived among us and the body of the one who uh, served uh, people like him. So his most famous song, or one of the most famous song, Manos Cariñosas, Loving Hands, uh, make references to um, the loving hands of Jesus during his ministry on earth. Uh, let's listen a little uh, bit of this song. Manos hymn composers followed uh, the Anglo-Saxon tune pattern. But in the 60s, uh, there were many changes in society, in religion, that uh, had uh, influence on Latin American hymnody. And we can say that there is uh, really a, a new Latin American hymnody starting um, from the 60s. That was a time of uh, social and political change a time where um, the Latin American leftis, left um, emerged uh, uh, in different forms throughout the continent, different movements, but uh, in general with a strong anti-imperialistic sentiment. Uh, that was a decade where several countries were under military dictatorship and a lot of political turmoil and tensions inside uh, different countries. That was a time of demographic change um, where um, uh, there was internal migration from rural areas to urban areas, to the, uh, people coming um, from uh, rural areas to the cities, and the emergence of a new um, impoverished social class, um, urban poverty. And uh, all this, um, this uh, social situation um, was uh, very well represented in the emergence of a new um, artistic expression, musical artistic expression, uh, usually called Nueva Cancion, New Song. Um, this was um, a movement uh, with a discursive project of 
Cultural Recovery and Memory. Musicians in Nueva Canción, in New Song Movement, embraced indigenous uh, instruments and rhythms, rejecting at the same time imperialism associated with U.S. popular culture and Latin American elites dismissal of indigenous cultures. Um, this movement, born in the secular society, influenced Christian uh, hymnody too. In uh, the religious field, there were also significant changes in the 60s. Uh, the emergence of Latin American liberation theology, the uh, Comunidades Ecclesiales de Base, um, in the Catholic world, uh, Vatican Council II and the liturgical renewal, also in the Catholic world, uh, which um, meant um, an, the embracement of um, vernacular languages and uh, folk local music um, and local forms of art. Uh, the growth of Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism has had been growing before. Pentecostalism was present in Latin America almost at the same time uh, it uh, was born in the U.S. And we had also um, very early streams of Pentecostalism coming from Sweden, from, from Europe. But it is, it is in the 60s and for some scholars linked to this um, demographic change and internal migration and new poverty that um, Pentecostalism found uh, a fertile soil to grow. And it's in the 60s where Pentecostalism starts becoming um, uh, noticeable. Then, at the same time, uh, the charismatic movement in the Catholic Church and in, uh, in some other uh, Protestant um, churches and uh, denominations. And um, Finally, to mention one more factor in this uh, decade, um, that was the time where most Protestant denominations um, found complete autonomy from um, the US. I mean, this process had started before in, for some other denominations, but we could say by, but uh, in general, by the 60s, uh, almost all denominations and churches in Latin America were independent from the U.S., at least in terms of leadership, not necessarily financially, but even uh, in many cases um, financially too. So this created a completely new uh, ecology that favored the emergence of a new, um, of new streams of Latin American hymnody, now really um, more inculturated. One of the new streams of Latin American hymnody that became more noticeable in the 60s uh, are the Pentecostal coritos. Uh, coritos um, are short choruses or refrains uh, which have um, an immediate antecedent in uh, the gospel hymns with its recurrent chorus. Coritos use local folk and popular rhythms um, and also um, popular instruments, especially guitars, um, making um, this singing more accessible for people without any um, formal musical training. And also, uh, these were songs that could be sung in a living room, in, a spo in a small places uh, that were not uh, traditional church buildings. Coritos have, uh, had and have um, simple lyrics uh, that people can uh, learn from memory very easily and are sung by heart. Um, the lyrics usually um, reflect uh, the, their experiences in Christian life, and in some other cases, they are based on the scriptures, um, sometimes even quoting literally the scriptures from the Reina Valera translation. Coritos reflect cultural values that are prevalent, in most Latin American societies, uh, such as orality and a circular uh, perception of time. And the simplicity of coritos made of them um, a key teaching tool, especially for undereducated people, for these um, uh, new migrants from rural areas to the cities, 
Uh, so we're key and are key to understand um, faith formation through singing in Latin America. Um, there was common practice uh, of singing these coritos in medleys. Some of these coritos are very celebratory, very joyful. Um, and in some other cases, the tunes are closer to uh, the romantic Latin American song, uh, allowing uh, the expression of uh, deep emotions and feelings. Let's listen to some uh, coritos. also a turning point for uh, Roman Catholic hymnody in Latin America with the emergence of vernacular songs. Uh, one of these uh, streams um, was um, or is represented by the Latin American folk masses starting in 1964 with Misa Criosha uh, from Argentina, um, but also the uh, um, emergence of composers um, who wrote songs for local congregations, uh, such as Osvaldo Catena, Cesario Garabain, and others. And one of the things I, I find so interesting of this period is the borrowing of songs, particularly between um, um, Roman Catholics and Pentecostals. Um, of course, other Protestants too borrowed these Catholic songs. Uh, Pescador de Hombres became sung across uh, many denominations and groups. But this, this borrowing is very interesting. Uh, Floricanto, as um, I mentioned on the screen, um, from 1989 includes Pentecostal songs. Um, I think it's, uh, it's very interesting, this exchange of songs in a context where the relationship between Protestants and Catholic had not been very friendly, um, yet the, the uh, inculturation uh, process made these two groups um, closer. Um, I'd like to invite you, because I am from Argentina and I love Misa Criosha, to listen uh, to this uh, part of the Mass. Gloria a 
los hombres, más a los hombres que a una señor. Te alabamos, te adoramos, te alabamos, te adoramos, te damos gracias. The 60s were a very uh, fruitful decade, and alongside Pentecostal Coritos and Roman Catholic um, um, vernacular songs, uh, there was other stream also in uh, Protestantism um, that I like to call Protestant ecumenical song. This was a stream um, mostly born um, from um, mainline denominations that uh, shows big respect for local cultures, embraced local music styles, use um, folk instruments, and um, brought new themes to congregational uh, hymnody. Um, songs about justice, songs about um, the earth and uh, earth care, um, about uh, human rights, um, on the screen, you have the picture of Pablo Sosa, Hymn Society Fellow, and uh, one of his contributions, uh, in addition to his beautiful songs, um, is a theological, the theological concept of the fiesta of the faithful. Fiesta in Spanish is not party, it's more a celebration. And he says, quote, the Spanish fiesta tradition rises out of oppression. People sing, clap, and dance not so much to forget their struggles, but to be nurtured by the sweet foretaste of the great fiesta of victory and celebration. For this reason, it is said, people who have no strength to celebrate have no strength to liberate themselves. You see here the connection, the connection with uh, some theological ideas from liberation theologians uh, in the language, um, and um, alongside Pablo Sosa, there were and there are other uh, important um, composers. I like to highlight um, other one, also from Argentina, uh, Bishop Federico Pagura. Um, Bishop Pagura was the, the first one who uh, dared to compose a Christian tango. Um, and it, it's very interesting how he worked uh, things out to use um, a folk um, music style that is absolutely identified with despair. Most tangs, tangos are about despair. And he wrote a tango uh, that is about hope. Tenemos esperanza. We have hope. Um, so he, he, he did a wonderful job um, embracing something from the culture but showing transformation through Christ. And this tango became iconic, uh, especially in, in very difficult times during the dictatorship, um, singing together, we have hope. And um, really it is a sort of, of, um, of hymn that uh, express a common feeling among most Protestants or most, most Christians in Latin America that despite all the troubles, all the injustice, all the oppression, we still have hope. Um, I like to share with you um, a song by uh, Pablo Sosa uh, that was sung in one of our uh, Calvin uh, worship symposium. Miren qué bueno, qué bueno es. Miren qué bueno es cuando los hermanos estamos juntos. Miren qué bueno. Qué bueno es cuando las hermanas están juntas.
The following big change in Latin American hymnody happened at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, with um, the arrival of praise and worship in Latin America. Um, on the screen you have Marcos Witt, uh, the most uh, renowned um, character uh, in this movement, but there were other, uh, and there are others, um, as noted on the screen. Um, and this is when um, basically worship wars started in Latin America, different from the US, but a lot of tension uh, on the one uh, hand, uh, those who were very attached to their hymn books and the gospel uh, hymnody tradition. On the other hand, Latin Americans that really wanted something more um, authentic, uh, more local, especially in terms of, um, of themes. And, and, and theological insights. So a lot of tension, but at the end, uh, um, the dissemination of this movement was uh, very significant. And um, massive worship conferences and concerts helped a lot to disseminate this music alongside uh, recordings, radio stations, and all sorts of media. Cancion, an organization created by Marcos Witt uh, was also very instrumental in disseminating this music um, because Cancion um, was a record uh, label but also um, had a branch of uh, worship leaders, leader, leadership training and uh, publications and, um, and of course the events, uh, the concerts, the conferences. So this uh, was all very helpful to make this music uh, very well known and adopted by many uh, different groups throughout Latin America. Praise and worship introduced many changes uh, in Latin American hymnody and the experience of faith in the region. Um, songs changed to first person singular, from we to I. Songs were uh, not about God, but addressed to God. Um, one of the first albums by Marcos Witt from 1991 was titled To We Show You and I. Um, praise and Worship uh, started using um, musical styles that were not typical of congregational settings, romantic music, Latin American popular music and instruments, not similar to um, uh, what had happened in the 60s with folk music, but more a uh, contemporary kind of Latin American uh, popular music. Um, music became central in public worship, sometimes even at the expense of the sermon. Um, worship leaders became uh, very um, respected and admired and played a different role than before. Um, even uh, new titles were used, like psalmists. Um, this uh, is related to the following point that were that is um, new uh, theological ideas in uh, some cases based on images from the Old Testament worship, tabernacle image, uh, the theological concept that praise brings God's presence among God's people, uh, the use of worship as weapon for a spiritual warfare and a new place for the body with uh, movements that were not um, traditionally um, common among Protestants and Evangelicals in Latin America, um, raising hands, dancing, clapping, um, jubilant shouts, and so forth, and a new place for emotion, a more emotional um, kind of uh, singing and uh, worship. Let's listen to a song by Marcos Witt.
partisan worship did not only uh, bring change to congregational singing, but also to um, general culture, uh, allowing um, other artists coming from the secular world um, starting to um, make uh, Christian music or to be public about their faith. And uh, on the screen, you have three um, well-known artists uh, from Latin America, Juan Luis Guerra, Shuri, and Ricardo Montaner, who have also recorded Christian songs, um, even though their careers were not as Christian music musicians primarily. As it happens in other parts of the world, Latin America is not an exception um, in regards to uh, global Christian music and the dissemination of music from other contexts, um, such as Hillsong music. Um, if you travel to uh, Latin America or you attend worship services in uh, Spanish-speaking congregations in the U.S., you will notice that many congregations, especially congregations that worship um, in a, a contemporary worship style, use um, songs that have been composed uh, in English and are translated into Spanish. Uh, Hillsong songs can be listened and sung uh, in many congregations throughout the region. And I included this as a challenge because somehow this is like going back to the times where most of the uh, songs sung in Spanish were translations in detriment of um, local uh, composers and local music and uh, our contextual uh, themes and, and, uh, and concerns. Yet there is a lot of creativity in Latin America and I'm very hopeful that this will be just a trend and some other waves uh, of um, more inculturated uh, songs will come. We have a very young church, and this means also that the church is alive, and there are many uh, musicians and worship leaders in our congregations. Um, in the last um, years, there has been revitalization of some uh, schools of music at seminaries, the development of uh, church music training programs, in many cases um, based at uh, local congregations. Despite this challenge, Latin American hymnody is alive, and it's alive because we are blessed by many gifted and talented hymn writers, songwriters throughout the continent. So my last words are words of gratitude to those of uh, them or those of you who write songs in a Spanish language for our congregations in Latin America and in the U.S. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, what a wonderful presentation. Uh, I got to see it before everyone else because I got to help with some of the video editing. Um, and so I was enjoying seeing that for the second time. And I think I learned as much the second time as I did the first time. <laughs> Um, there are no questions in the Q and a folks. So if you have questions, we are now live, please ask. This is, this is a chance to pick the brain of an expert. Let's do it. Um, I'll, I'll start. <clears throat> so good to see so many good friends in the chat. <laughs> yeah. I, I loved watching the chat happen. Um, just, uh, and my colleagues at CICW. <laughs> um, oh, so see, Mike said he had a question, but it was answered during the course of the presentation. So there you go. I mean, maybe maybe you have answered everyone's questions. Um, but if not, use the Q and A. I'll I'll ask one question <clears throat> that was that was in my mind. Um, well, recently, Maria, I've I've been spending a lot of time with uh, a young lady uh, who's from Colombia. And when she came over to the United States, uh, for instance, we were grocery shopping, you know, and, uh, and I took her to the international section because she was looking for some things that she wanted from from Colombia. And she said, this is all Mexican. 
And so we, and we've had a series of conversations where <clears throat> she has noticed that the Latina culture in America seems to be very dominated by Mexican culture. And I wonder how much, but, but I also noticed that so many of the songs and examples that you raised up were not, I mean, they were from, they were from all, all over Latin America. So I wonder for the church in America, which has a huge, um, you know, a huge amount of, of people from all over Latin America, how, how much of that Mexican culture has, has kind of taken the forefront? Um, and do you think it's disproportionate to, to the contributions of all the other countries and cultures in Latin America? This is a very good question. And I think it's uh, the Mexican influence is proportionate to Mexican immigration to the US. I mean, it's by far the largest group. And in some, the, depending on where you are in the US, um, they are very, uh, Mexicans are uh, largely the biggest group. Um, I live in Miami, Florida, and here it is different. There are Mexicans, but there are people particularly from Central America and Colombia and Peru and Argentina and many other places. So Cuba. You, yeah, of course, Cuba. <laughs> so you find more diversity in, in this place than in other parts of the U.S. Yet I think that because, um, because the border <laughs> went by or over Mexicans in some cases, so the Mexican influence in the South, I, I mentioned when I told the story of um, Vicente Mendoza, you know, he was going back and forth. Some hymnals were published uh, in El Paso, Texas, um, for instance, for the Baptists and in the committee and people who selected the songs were mostly Mexicans, even though this hymnal was intended to serve all the region. And some people in, in the Catholic world also, I mean, when they tried to do something inculturated, Protestant and Catholic, they usually um, bring mariachis uh, as a way to you know, build this bridge. And, and I think it, it's, it, it, it has a place, um, but we need to be aware that uh, Latin America is very diverse and we are not all Mexicans. We do not all eat the same food, speak Spanish the same way, and that there are other voices that need to be uh, included or could be included in, in the mix. Perhaps the, the most sensitive thing is if you have a dominant Mexican congregation, uh, go for it, but uh, be aware of other, uh, other composers and other songs. And the other thing that also is relevant is that Marcos Witt is from Mexico. And he, is, he was like the main character in this praise and worship. And I still recall in the, in the 90s, uh, worship leaders in my, in my home country and they speak the language very, with very different accent. And then for, due to imitation, we had all these um, worship leaders speaking as Mexicans. So Mexico was influential also in Latin America through Marcos Witt and a lot of rhythms and, and the training through his schools throughout the continent. So there is some sort of Mexican flavor in other places too. But. Mart Martin Tell put in the chat that um, an observation by, by one of their Mexican students at, at uh, Princeton said that resources tend to be tilted towards Puerto Ricans. There you go. In the, because on the East Coast, you have the Domin people from the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. So yeah, it depends on mm -hmm. where you are in, in the US. Sure. Um, another question that, that I, I've had in, in my mind um, recently is as, as the Hymn Society has heard from and learned from uh, uh, indigenous communities in the US and Canada, I, I wonder, do, do you have a sense of congregational song or, or just general um, cultural exchange or conversations happening within the church in Latin America between um, the, the Spanish speaking dominant cultures and the Native American communities or not Native American, Native yeah. indigenous communities? Certainly, certainly there are. Um... In every country is different. Uh, there are countries in Latin America with the uh, largest population of, of native people and other um, languages spoken. Uh, and in other countries, this influence is, uh, is uh, smaller. Uh, but yes, there are 
Yet, I think we are not at the same point as Canada uh, or um, some groups here. I, I think still we have, um, we have to do more work in terms of honoring the native cultures. Some of the songs I um, like Misa Criolla include these instruments and some uh, folk music. But I think we still need to um, honor uh, native cultures in a different way to recognize their contribution. I think that we are a little bit behind, um, but it's something that it's important for us to, to be aware of and to include um, more of these traditions. I'll, I'll, I'll end our time with this question, Maria, unless something pops up in the Q&A. <clears throat> so this is just turning out to be Brian's curiosity being, <laughs> being met. But... I like Brian's curiosity. <laughs> um, okay. Y you mentioned uh, uh, in, in, while we were talking about the, the Mexican culture, uh, you know, the amount of immigrants and, and Spanish-speaking communities within the United States continues to grow and grow to, to the point where I, I can't remember the exact year, but um, largely due to the number of Latin American immigrants coming to the United States, I think it, it, certainly within my lifetime, but probably within the lifetime of most people on this listening to this webinar, um, kind of Anglo people or, you know, white people will no longer be in the majority. And uh, Spanish speaking and, and many other languages uh, will be, it'll be a plurality. So at, at what, at what point do you think will, will the church in the U S be considered a part of Latin American culture? It, <laughs> well, or it, is it already? I believe it is already. Um, there are more people who speak Spanish in this country than in many countries in Latin America uh, in terms of numbers. Um, and also there is, uh, and I tried to say this uh, in, in the presentation that it's, it's hard to um, make geographical references in, in this uh, world where things are um, more fluid and, and, and even in, uh, historically Spain or Latin America. Now when we say Latin America, we include the Spanish-speaking congregations in, in the U.S. And even, I mean, um, praise and worship that is now very dominant in Latin America. This is a movement from the U.S. And then Marcos Witt, as he's bicultural, um, brought it to Latin America and then it exploded in Latin America. So we are in constant um, uh, relationship, back and forth. People come to the U.S., um, now we have, uh, especially these independent congregations from Latin America that are uh, doing church planting in the U.S. We have congregations in the U.S. who support work or missionary work in, in Latin America. And the same happens with songs that travel. And well, not, not only from the U.S. and Latin America, but as, as I mentioned, uh, we have the Hillsong phenomenon in Latin America too. But um, to your question, yes, I think this, there, is, uh, there are very close ties between congregations here and in Latin America, and, and the, there is a, this, this, this synergy. Um, and I hope we can have uh, more uh, composers um, from, Latin, from uh, the Spanish-speaking congregations here that could be known in Latin America. I think that, that this is another, another thing, the dissemination, um, I heard very um, point nine uh, songs about the experience of migration that are not known in Latin America. So I think uh, there is still room for um, more exchange. We do have a question in the Q&A from Diana Sanchez Bujang. And she asks, um, or she says, tell us how the hymnal Santo 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 is being adopted across the U.S. Do you see any trends or any surprises? Uh, no, we are very happy with. I have I have my copy here. Uh, we are very happy with the hymnal. Uh, I think that's due to the to the 
COVID, um, we, we didn't have so many opportunities as we had planned to um, do more um, church visits and promoting the hymnal more. Um, but uh, to your question, Diana, uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, we have um, a program of um, festivals for congregations who like to um, experience with this hymn book. And uh, so you can apply through our webpage and those congregations who want to do this bilingual festivals receive some free copies of the hymnal and some support from us. So uh, we hope this could help to promote the resource um, more broadly. And it Becky, like... and Becky just, yeah. just uh, <laughs> thank you, Becky. <laughs> it's always good to have someone in the chat ready to, to put in resources that you name. <laughs> That's great. Um, fantastic. Well, Maria, thank you so much for this webinar, um, for taking us through this journey and teaching us so much. Um, it, I know it was a broad, a broad view. Um, there's so much yeah. that we could then kind of delve into the details. Um, I wonder, are, are there any resources if, if, if something that you touched on during this kind of overview, um, if someone wanted to learn more about uh, some of those topics. Are there some resources you could point us towards um, that they could buy maybe any books or other webinars that that dive deeper into a particular time period or anything uh, like that, that? That's interesting. We don't have many publications. So I went through different kinds of resources and tried to put this together to share an overview. Uh, but you can contact me and I can share my sources with you. Everything is a split. And also... Um, and again, not trying to publicize, advertise our hymnal, but the hymnal uh, includes all this stream. And this is something we have intentionally, well, except from the Metrified songs from the 16th century, uh, all the other songs and streams I mentioned are included in the hymnal so people can have a taste of uh, how people sang in different times, in different uh, traditions. And we hope to continue including new songs, not in the hymn book, but in our other resources in, available in our web page. Well, thank you so much. Um, friends, if you are looking forward to the next uh, webinar from the Hymn Society, we've got um, some interviews coming up with Mike McMahon. Um, next week, he'll be talking with Cynthia Wilson. Um, and then we have another webinar uh, under this series. Wait, is this the last one? Maybe Mike could pop on here if he's still here and, and remind me, you know, I should, I should know this. Um, I feel like there's one more and I can't remember who it is. Holy moly. Well, anyways, we'll point you towards the, what there's Mike. So the next one is uh, with Ricky Manalo. That's right. On the, the last Tuesday of, of April. So it's a different day of the week. Right. And he's covering, um, Chinese and I Vietnamese. Chinese and Filipino American Filipino uh, American song. So that'll be the last webinar in this series. Um, and if you missed this or part of it, or you want to watch it again, uh, we should have the archive of this presentation up and available within the next couple of days. So thanks for being with us, Maria. Thank you so much. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much.